So we're here. Okay. So we've agreed to so Austin and write an email confirming Monday, and we'll go from there. And then at least that, that portion is settled. Stuff I wanted to do. Okay. I did want to, uh, you know, look at that zip file. That was the best part of me. That, what I, I, it was right here. We're going to have to download this again. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I opened it up already, which just shows you. But I don't know what I'm doing. I, there's only two animations left that I have to show you. And we're completing that chapter. And that I, 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 I know we looked at this. I want to review it for you without having, I, I don't have to necessarily use sound in which to narrate that. But they'll, the next one's yes. So this is the one that we did at the very end last time. And this is by far and away the most important of all ones because it involves this is certainly the most common things that you need to take home with you not all cells have plasmids and certainly not all cells have this f or fertility plasma and again the reinforcing point is the fertility plasmid has two things okay that we know it codes for that are the information is on is to assemble this pillus or pilus and to accomplish the transfer that i'm going to sort of scroll through manually right and because you can listen to it as many times as you wish what ha effectively that plasmid can carry any number of other properties including resistance if a plasmid carries resistance it's, it's an r plasmid so an f plasmid could be an r but an r isn't necessarily an f so the f plasmid is the most specific aspect resistance we could you know basically is uh, place that on any plasmid and again during this process which doesn't which maybe takes a couple of minutes more than one plasmid can transfer we're just talking about a single strand of dna so that opening is wide enough for additional genetic information to be transferred as well and this happens with a great degree of frequency it is in this case it's a one time transfer what happens as you will see as soon as that transfer is completed this cell receiving that plasmid immediately becomes F positive. And that's what stops the that's what stops the activity. And at that point it replicates as F positive. And that's why overnight an entire population will become F positive. And if it's transferring something like methicillin resistance to Staphylococcus aureus, then it's all going to be MRSA overnight. That's the big deal about this particular structure there's some nuances it's similar to the other ones and how it kind of works we're still subject to repair changes there's a you know it's not something that's going to immediately work every time but once that f plasma moves whatever moves with it it finalizes because now that becomes f positive so it's an interesting phenomenon so what we see here is so they come into contact there's f negatives and f positives most of the time they're in the same species Sometimes it can transfer species. In other words, it doesn't, it's, let's say it's E. coli to E. coli or Staph aureus to Staph aureus. If there's similarities, and it's about the receptor. So there's just, there's so many millions of them swimming around that they come into contact with one another and establish this contact point and this passageway. Now that initiates the transfer. So you're going to see something they call the rolling. So there's something called the origin of transfer, where this starts. And understand, if we were transferring a plasmid in its entirety, what would happen is immediately as it's disrupted, that cell can no longer transfer anything. Wouldn't, because if the plasmid's not there and intact, all of a sudden that cell can't do it anymore. So it starts at a very specific location. And you'll see what they comment on, something called the rolling circle mechanism what it means is that leaving the cell that you can see on this side as you look at it on the left and going to the cell on the right the plasmid that one strand on the outside is being continuously resynthesized meaning it, it never goes away just a piece as soon as it starts to leave at this origin as you can see there in red now it immediately here's it's an endonuclease immediately that's just the initiating point we use that in genetic engineering 
we know where the origin of transfer is in genetic engineering. We try to put the DNA we want to add to the plasma near there, knowing that the closer it is to the plasma, the more likely it is to be transferred. So now it starts that rolling circle. So it's continuously, you may not show it in the diagram, but the plasma is never disrupted. As soon as that, in a couple of three, four minutes, as soon as the entirety of that plasmid is assembled, immediately it stops because it immediately then synthesizes the outer strand and effectively now it's F positive. So whatever is transferred is transferred and we're done. So the take home points now at that point, again, it's new DNA. There's certainly mechanisms inside that may look at mismatch repair. So they're not always there, but in general, once that plasma transfers, it's now it's become stable DNA and it replicates. So what happens, we started with one, one went to another one. Now we have two. So they both replicate. So that two becomes four. Now we have four cells that can basically transfer plasmids to four other cells. Now we have eight when they replicate. Now we have 16. So rapidly given that the replication cycle is every 20 to 30 minutes for most of these bacteria, that whole, that whole slew in the infection site is magically going to become MRSA or change. That's why it's terribly important. So look at that. If you have questions, just let me know. That's the first one. And there's one more left to do, and, and it's the briefest one of all of these. That's the transposons or transposable elements. That's the one she did all of that. For transposons are segments of DNA that are capable of shifting from one location to another. A transposon enters the cell by being carried on a plasmid. A transposon can then move from the plasmid into the host cell genome. A transposon can move from one site on the host genome to another site on the host genome. When some transposons move, they replicate, leaving a copy in the original position. A transposon can also move from the host genome to a plasmid. And so it's really basically the, the point remember about transposons is when they move, they can move in and out of cells at random. They're carried by plasmids. When we get to it, when we talk about antibiotics, I'll explain this is how vancomycin resistance was passed from one species of bacteria to another. And the interesting part is it leaves imprints in almost a random order along that DNA strand. And that, when the research was done, with the corn with those specific repeat patterns, this was the only logical explanation and eventually was borne out. So they're originally called jumping genes, but now the name is transposons. And I mean, so you do need to at least recall that. And that basically is the end of the genetics. The key parts of the genetics unit are certainly to understand why bacteria are more likely to mutate than eukarya to understand there's spontaneous mutations, ones that occur with replications for all of us, bacteria, us, ourselves. And then there's ones that are induced. And when it's induced, it increases the odds of mutation, typically by a factor of a thousand. Because mutation rates are much higher in prokaryotic cells like bacteria, you could mutate as much as one out of 10 times. That's why it's, it, it can be so dramatic that changes that can occur in bacteria and why we get some pretty bizarre things that happen to them and more so today than we used to. Every time we use a new antibiotic, we're at risk of generating new, new and different kinds of mutations that may or may not create more problems for us down the road. That you should know. You should know the difference between silent mutations and nonsense and missense mutations. The idea that a point mutation is one isolated location affecting one DNA base as opposed to those frame shift ones where you're either adding or losing some. Those inevitably are big problems. That's the meat of this. Know about the Ames test. Know about 
what the plasma does. That's why I've, I've done it now two or three different times. And I'm sure I'll do it again in a review video. So, enjoy. I'm happy to say we are at the end of this. Delighted. Which brings us to viruses. So if you think bacteria were funny, viruses are really odd. So you will find this in Cowan's chapter 5, and you'll find this in Nestor's chapter 13. And the charts are better here. The background is pretty good here. So this today, the first part of this presentation is background. And more so than anything else. So I can, and here is chapter five. And you'll see at the very end, and inevitably they do, they, cop, they we cover a little bit about prions with little we know. And, 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 and uh, there's going to be a few questions. There's something else called viroids, uh, which we don't do. They affect plants. And as you probably remember from me multiple times saying, I don't do plants. Uh, 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 okay. Right off the PowerPoint. We already did this. Viruses infect every living thing. Doesn't matter bacteria, archaea, algae, us. Next time you're in the ocean, think about that. 10 million viruses per milliliter. Hey, it's okay. I'm going to be at the beach and I, I, I won't be here on the, I tell you, I won't be here on the 8th. Flying to Jacksonville. Taking a day off. So if you want to get out of here early, for me, adios. Okay. So I'll be on the beach there. I'm sure. Even got a beachfront view on, on, on the naval base. It's okay. I have friends in moderately high places. I'm still there. Yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah. We're going there to visit him and the grandkids and his wife. We're going there to visit his wife and the grandkids. He'll be there. It's nice down there. And then we're going back for change of command in May. Okay. Yeah, then he'll be back to D.C. Your neck of the woods. Yeah. So viral infections were unknown and Pasteur was caused by a living thing small. He didn't know in modern classification that we don't consider them living, but he knew it was an entity that was smaller than a bacteria because he couldn't find the bacteria with his advances in microscopy. And he was the one who coined the term virus, which in Latin meant poison. So the most studied early virus historically, you don't have to know the names, was tobacco mosaic virus. Okay. So, and and then foot and mouth disease in cattle. Why these were so important? Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the economies were not based, not industrially based, or certainly tech based like we have today. They were based on agrarian, so they were growing things, food related, cows, pigs, and tobacco was the biggest one of them all for the longest time. If you, if, you, if you go back in history and, and, you, and you hear about the Spanish Armada and Elizabeth I, that was all about tobacco. But as the English didn't want to give the Spanish sort of the keys to the door for tobacco making, which they found in Virginia and then and all that. It was a big war over that. So, and foot and mouth disease was historic. It doesn't affect us. And if you were exposed, it would not be of any consequence comparatively speaking. So when fluids from host organisms pass through filters, the filtrate remained infectious. So the infection caused by a fluid containing agents more than bacteria. That's meant by filterable viruses. We, we really don't have a virus, even those wonderful high efficiency particulate air filters, unless the virus is very large, you're not going to be trapped by that. So we get into all the different things about it. Uh, are they alive? Modern theory is, says they are not because they're not made of cells. Role in evolution, I can't really comment on. Distinctive characteristics, we can. Okay, and how they work, we can. And the connection with viruses and cancer is immense. Everybody here, understand 
that 15 to 30 percent by almost if you as sort of assimilate all the authors on all the textbooks the average i've seen 20 to 40 15 to 30 percent of all cancers in us are caused by viruses and more than half of those i can assure you are human papillomavirus so hpv genital warts whatever you want to call them cervical carcinomas and penile carcinomas they are there they're a big player now it's not only them but there's a big role there's a big and we go into it in this chapter specifically how the viruses do this we're going to do it somewhat generically explaining the role that viruses have and why they create a passageway for cancer uh, but it, it's, it's really a good primer so you understand it but so i uh, it's to me it's not any uh, to me there i don't even get into this debate so and i and really and i'll say this a zillion times we're going to kill those viruses and the reality is since they're living you can't kill them so active and inactive active and inert whatever you want to call it you can't say kill you can say destroy who cares so so they can not only infect cells per se, they can alter those cells permanently. They can actually cause them to do a variety. They can change what the cell does. They can take over the cell and turn it into a little factory to make more viruses. When you hear about, I'm getting over a virus, your cells never get over a virus. Once your cells are infected by the virus, there's irreversible change. They either become a viral factory for as long as they survive or they die, period. Okay. You may get over it from a standpoint of your immune system, but that's it. So, yes, there's a lot of ways with evolution. I'm not going to get into it. That's an interesting. When they've mapped the genome, a lot of it is so viruses have impacted us. So, even more so with bacteria. By definition, we call them, and it's an important term, obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot survive outside the cell for very long. You're going to see with certain kinds of viruses on a moist area, they have, once that area dries, basically the viruses are gone. On a dry thing like a tabletop, some viruses can survive a little bit. Those are things we talk about how they spread. A lot of this chapter is how we categorize them, how they spread, okay? And very often, uh, some interesting ways about generically sort of some of the diseases they cause without us going crazy about diseases just yet. So they're obligate intracellular parasites in order for them to flourish and do whatever to replicate. They have to be inside a living thing. So, I mean, I don't even, you know, imagine how many zeros you have after that, 31 zeros. So, I, I, who cares? It's not the number anybody would have to remember. Ubiquitous is a great word. Ubiquitous means just that, they're everywhere. Just the seawater. No, they're everywhere. Ultramicroscopic, they're extraordinarily small. The relationship is almost similar if you think of how small, you're all looking at bacteria under your microscope a thousand times magnified in the lab under oil immersion, right? Viruses are probably, to a, a bacteria, a virus would be about the same thing. So it's a, you, we're talking orders of a thousand to a million times smaller than that E. coli you have a tough time finding under the microscope. Right? You don't want that. So very compact, as you will see. Don't, because they're not made of cells, number one. Remember, DNA or RNA, never both. And basically, you have some kind of nucleic acid, DNA, or RNA, in a protein shell we call a capsid. That's the minimum requirements for viruses. There it is again. We say this 4,000 times. Get sick of it now. But remember it. And unlike our cells, where RNA is single-stranded and viruses are double-stranded, uh, I mean, or where DNA is double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded, you can have all variations. You can have single DNA and double RNA. And thank goodness you don't have to know. You don't have to know anything about positive or negative sense. 
I'm going to, I'll show you the strandedness of one is relevant, and that's the one that has the ocean with blue. Because it's a good idea, it gives you an idea of why blue is so difficult and, and basically extrapolates to COVID, why COVID is so difficult. Okay. So they are very, very specific. You're going to see tiny proteins project from that capsid, that shell, and that's how they attach to your cell. If the cell has to have a receptor, I'm not suggesting you do this. But if you want, if you got a whole bunch of nasty viruses that affected your uh, your stomach, as long and they were on your hands, as long as you thoroughly washed your hands, you're at very very little risk for them to be a problem, because there's no receptors. They're not skin viruses. So wart virus would be an example. And effectively, they take over. Basically, they, you might remember that animation with transduction. Once a virus enters a living cell, it takes over. It destroys the host cell's genetic material. Basically, it's blueprint for making other cells and takes over and makes more viruses. So typically, they don't have all the stuff needed for metabolism. They can't do protein synthesis. A lot of times, you'll see they're packaged with enzymes that assist their takeover or their replication. Okay, and we're going to take a look at the classification without going crazy. We're not doing eight orders in 38 families. We're making it pretty simple. What group they belong to and what, what, what are the characteristics of that group. So we are going to look at the host, in other words, and they're not all straightforward. Some viruses are completely about us. Some affect multiple species. Rabies. If you're a mammal, you can get rabies. The dog, your cat, the squirrel, the chipmunk, the bat, doesn't matter. Flu. COVID. Pigs. You know, different kinds of pig species, bird species, us species. Okay, horses for influenza. There's lots. Okay, so it's not specific. So some are strictly, and you're going to see these are human to human, not all of them are. We're going to look at whether, how they're, kind of the general generics of their assembly, the DNA or RNA, and then, and then there's other ways to classify them as well as we will get to. So again, obligate intracellular parasites, that's important. Eh, size, not a big deal to me, they're small. The capsids are significant. Enveloped versus naked is significant. The spikes are how they attach, as you will see, and we will look at it. So, yes, they're the smallest of the infectious agents. The smallest virus, about 20 nanometers. That's billions of a meter. So, I mean, that's the tiny one that's sort of proportionate, like it is to, like it's to the bacteria, like the bacteria does. Kind of that one. Might be the way to look at it. You'd have to magnify that. And the only way we really see them, other than ones that are extraordinarily large, is with an electron microscope. You can see evidence of them with a light microscope. Like you use. Parvovirus. Who gets parvo? Dogs. Absolutely. We do too, by the way. But parvo is a class, and most of your dogs are immunized for parvo. Particularly if they're, in the old days, of course, if the parvo was, in me. I had a dog that got parvo virus. We had to be away a lot, because we were in the process of adopting our first child, and we had, we had two Springer Spaniels. And it was, we, we were able to place one, but the other one we had difficulty placing, he had to be kenneled for quite a bit because my wife had to live for six months with a new baby. He got parvo. And, I mean, he's growing up and blood at both ends. He survived that remark. Most dogs did. From that particular kennel. Reggie. His niece, Trudy, was the other. That's a long time ago. Okay, so herpes simplex, bigger. 
and we'll see a lot about that. Some relatively long, some narrow, there's a lot of variation. So we'll talk about parvo, particularly when we get to, yeah, just bring it in and leave it here. Thank you. Okay, so as we go down here, there's that E. coli. Okay, and we're going down here and I have to get up close to read it. So poliovirus, one of the small ones, yellow fever. Okay, way down here. So imagine how tiny that is, comparatively speaking. So it's, it's, it's not any important. You don't have to remember any of the batting order that's there. Some are larger than others. This is what they look like electron microscopy-wise. And you can see there's a lot of different shapes. Typically, we have to use stains. You're going to see ones that are linear, one that appears somewhat round. Some are more like this. So rabies would look more like this. A common cold would look like this. Ebola would look more like that. So there's different kinds of shapes that are there. So they're just they're a totally different thing. Okay, no resemblance to cells. Don't have any mechanism to make stuff. It's basically that appearance they describe as crystal. I don't know if I use that term. The capsid, that outer layer, is just repeat units of identical proteins put together in typically a somewhat geometric fashion. Not always, but similar to that. Okay, And really, they don't have a whole lot other than a coat, the DNA or RNA, maybe an enzyme. That's about it. So let me give you, I'll stand up and give you some classification stuff while I'm speaking about it. So, first, how do we categorize them? Their genome. Are they a DNA virus or an RNA virus? We'll paint a little with a broad brush down the road, but I'll give it to you now. DNA viruses have a tendency more than any other to become late. Post Meaning once you have it, you have it. Will it trouble you forever? No. Will it trouble you forever? Yes. With a lot of variability. So latency is a problem with them. RNA viruses mutate. I would think to me the one that mutates the most is in months of COVID is in that family and we're around it. How many days do you go without visiting your screen? Oh, a good one. And we'll get into the nuances of HIV. So for our purposes, for now, DNA or R is how the first characters. Second has to do with their shape. And I sometimes call it their architecture. It's kind of how they're built. And you can have ones that, ones that kind of look a little round, have a fancy name. Microscopically, they're actually an icosahedron. <laughs> so for all you ge with solid geometry fans, that's a 20-sided, it's like you had, a, you had a board game and had a dice that had 20 sides, and they come with that, that's an icosahedron. But it looks microscopically somewhat round. And, it's all, and the funny thing is, each of the sides are made up of equilateral triangles, They're all with the same side. It is, so it's very, very geometric in its nature. And so the name we get because all the sides are the same length, we sometimes nickname them isometric. Here are those two things for them. That's one. Two. The one that I showed you kind of linear, tobacco mosaics like that, all those like that. Rabies is in that category, interestingly enough. We call them helical or filamentous. They're like a little tiny filament. And the helical is kind of like they're assembled, kind of like the epitelis. Basically, the proteins that kind of wrap around this way, like you have a bat or a hockey stick in your table. Uh, and then the other term is we give, depending on the kind of virus, either 
complex or something called cleiform. Cleiform means in some other form. That's typically associated with viruses that affect us or those animals. And complex typically are ones that affect bacteria. They have a fancy name called bacteria phase. And there is the illustrations of all those. And that's so that's this is category one, category two, and category three is very simple. We either have an envelope made of a membrane with protein spikes, we have enveloped, or one that doesn't have that called naked or not. That's the major classification. We start with that. Then we have to look at how they spread. And so they don't all, some of them, we, to be fair, I only ever ask you about how they spread when we know for sure. We're not, for instance, COVID would be in that, we're not sure. Okay. I personally feel from everything I've read that it's respiratory. Coughing, you know, in an article, in the hell you're Okay. Influenza, sure. So, ones that we see it are this. And the spread. Fecal to oral. It is something that we excrete. It gets, basically, it contaminates the surface from feces. And that's where the hand washing and all that food up and it gets on the food and we ingest it. Fecal to oral. Just what it sounds like. Two, respiratory. Inhaling it. And typically, the way that they come in is how they go out. So if they go in in the gastrointestinal tract, fecal to oral, you swallow them, they go out the other way. Respiratory, if you inhale them, they typically make you cough, out they go. The you know, oral ones typically give you diarrhea. That's how it's Three, the global term is zoonotic. That means really another species. So the classic would be rabies, bitten by a rabid animal, right? So it's, and, and, and that animal can have the disease and give it to you, okay? It's not always that. Lyme disease, even though that's not a virus, that's a bacteria, that's typically a zoonotic kind of a situation. Uh, yellow fever would be a good example of a virus for that, which comes from a mosquito. Okay? So it's in the mosquito, the mosquito lights on you, it, it, basically, mosquitoes, when they, when they bite you, they're seeking a blood meal. It's in their bloodstream. It's in your bloodstream. Now you're in trouble. Okay, so I, the subcategory of that is called arbovirus. It has nothing to do, it's not arbor, it's not trees. It's short for arthropod or area. So they get the arbo. That. Arthropods are insects, ticks, mosquitoes. Yeah. And lastly, the one most people are very familiar with, that, I mean, the best way would be to describe as blood and body fluids. And honestly, I would add close, intimate contact. Because it doesn't always have to be blood or body fluids, it can be skin to skin. That's how it works. General words. And the other name we typically get is sexually transmitted. Even though it doesn't, it does, it does not exclude, it doesn't have to necessarily be intercourse, whatever kind that would be, but you get the idea. Oh, that was a lot of energy. I've done this before this lecture. This is another one of those get out of bed in the morning. I heard my son earlier this morning. I'm sick. I'm on my way to work. Why? My boss and I were out having a few last night. <laughs> so, well, long as you got to know your boss. 
All right, moving on. So the capsid is the protein shell. When we look at just the capsid and the genetic material, the name is nucleocapsid. Naked viruses, by definition, just have a nucleocapsid. And you'll see the illustration with these little protein spikes protruding. The envelope is typically cell membrane from your cell, from my cell. Okay? And there's lots of illustrations and there's micrographs of it as it's being extruded or spit out or shed is the term we use a lot from, let's say, one of our cells. Okay, like the flu. On its way out, it picks up some membrane. It has already embedded those protein spikes in one of our cell membranes and it kind of takes it and surrounds the virus. You want to say protect it, but it's really part of its assembly. Part of its assembly. The spikes are on both. They're on the naked viruses. And this is not, it's not just enveloped viruses. It's on the envelope. And that's the single most important thing I can tell you how these play into control. Envelopes are made out of membrane. Membrane is easy to get rid of. Enveloped viruses are very easy to get rid of. That hand sanitizer is alcohol. Alcohol works mostly by disrupting cell membranes. That's why, and, and that, this alarm that we had about COVID, I was, ba- I was baffled by how they responded to it. I was baffled by the lack of understanding. Oh my God, we had people contact us with the stuff that we saw. How do you protect against COVID? It's a freaking enveloped virus and the dry area is going to die. You didn't tell me. Oh, we're very cautious. We wear gloves, liars. It's a squish metal. Throw it in a plastic bag and send it to them. But I digress. Two plastic bags. We have, we do gloves on. The reality is, it's an enveloped virus. It doesn't survive long on surfaces. I don't know. It just does not. If you show it a picture of an antiseptic, it'll oh, you're done. <laughs> I can just see it. Oh, no. There was no commercial for an insecticide raid. Raid would come in and the bugs would start dropping over dead from fear. Commercials were much more ingenious. Back then. But, oh, they are awful. I mean, I don't know what to do. We have to use all this non, you know, pet friendly stuff. You know, you have to take, I can't take the cats out of the house. You put them in a cat carrier, it's it's a muathon. I have never, we have what? He will not stop when he has to go to the bed. The other one will just, eh, eh, just watch it. The dog's a little bit better. We're going by. Yes. So they project from the nucleocapsid, if it's naked, and or the envelope when it's enveloped. And that's why naked viruses, HPV, common cold, are big problems. Virion is the name that we use for a virus that theoretically could infect you. So we we often look at the number of, you'll hear the term, we'll read about virions. Those are viruses that are active and can hurt you. This is a really good illustration. These are the protein spikes. This is that isometric virus. They're not showing you all 20 sides, but you kind of get to the idea. The capsid, and there's better illustrations. It it looks a little bit like this. And on each of those equilateral triangles, there are 20 of those individual proteins called capsimers or capsimers, depending on who's writing it. So there's little individual ones that make up this equilateral triangle that are there. It's like, you know, however they do it, six, five, four, three, two, one, whatever, however that works out to work. Okay. And these are the spikes, the spikes, that's the part that attaches to the receptor on the cell. So this, even though the genetic material may be similar, much harder to destroy because you have to have something strong enough to denature those proteins. Whereas here we just, 
it does, there's nothing to attach it. That can sit there forever without that envelope and of no consequence because there's no, no way it can attach to anything that you have. And effectively, then it just deteriorates over time. It just doesn't lay there. Okay? Because the spikes, even though they don't depict them with a the little spike portion of it, are all outside the envelope. And those spikes are significant. When we start talking about influenza, and we talk about other viruses, the spikes do certain things. They facilitate both attachment and release. And you down the road, something I'll just say to you in passing, every time we have a flu epidemic, and we've kind of downplayed those because we have, everybody's more COVID-oriented, they talk about, you might remember, it's called H1N1. That's ringing a bell. That was back in 09, so 14 years ago. The H and N have to do with identification of those spikes. We'll get to that down the road. So the two major helical and icosahedral, and you can call them filamentous or isometric, doesn't matter. Okay, the capsid is really the big deal. And again, if it's not one of those, it's it's an oddball. And we'll either serve the term pleiform, or when we do talk about viruses and bacteria complex. Capsomeres spontaneously self-assemble. So we don't have to do anything about them. Envelop viruses, pick up the membrane on the way out the door. We call it budding or shedding. It's like, it's almost like you're popping them off. You're inside one of our cells and the cell just starts to they kind of extrude and pick up a little membrane. Almost like they're spit out with a little membrane coat. So it's kind of like they bulge and the next thing you know, pop. I'm trying to think of a good now. And as you can see, the envelope could go from almost any place where there's membrane. So enveloped viruses can have, the, when they talk about pleomorphs here, you're going to see ones that are classically pleomorphic. So I wouldn't be confused about that for time now. But this is what they look like a little bit. Helical, again, it's almost that spiral. This is a very famous tobacco mosaic virus. That's there. So you can see tobacco mosaic, and this is influenza. Okay. So you can see how the arrangement is certainly different. Here you have that strand of RNA here. Here you actually have multiple strands of RNA so they don't depict it. So naked helical viruses are very rigid and tightly wound into that cylindrical shape. That's the tobacco. Enveloped helical nucleocapsids are more flexible. And uh, you can see this in other ones. Influenza, measles, rabies, okay, are all technically, you see that influenza and measles are technically pleomorphs, and rabies is probably more, we would classify as more of a filamentous virus, but we'll get to all of those. So there's a lot of variation. It would be the way I would describe it. And here you can see, again, the icosahedron, 20-sided figure, 12 evenly spaced corners. I don't care. 252 capsimeres. But it's a big player. because We're going to spend some time here with polio. We're going to spend time about adenoviruses and all those things. So, hepatitis B, herpes simplex. Hepatitis B, less of an issue these days. This is the complex. Thankfully, this doesn't do anything to us. This is kind of like the one where I showed you the transduction animation. The complex, the genetic material is in here, and this is the capsid. All this other jazz, the tail pins or tail fibers are how they attach to the bacteria. And effectively, think of this assembly here as a syringe, just like you would inject somebody with medication. Effectively, they're injecting DNA or the RNA, whatever type it is. And that's actual microgram. And you'll see other ones like this. Exactly what they, to me, they look like the lunar landing module back from 1969. Yeah. One giant step for man. We just landed a module. See, in our generation, everybody knew where they were with the Kennedy assassination. Everybody knew where they were when, when the lunar landing occurred in August of 69. We all knew that. 
there are certain events. That's you. You guys, because most of you, uh, the, my children's generation was 9-11. I don't know, thankfully, I hope you haven't had one and we never will. One of those, oh my God. So we talk about the genome. It's the genetic information standard. And you can see it varies. Hepatitis B was deadly for the longest time. Now we have an immunization for genes. Herpes viruses, hundreds. Okay. And really their whole job is how to get in and how to basically take over. Uh, We don't do any of these senses. The only one that I'm going to talk about a little bit down the road are segmented and spend a fair amount of time on the retrovirus that's each other. So we'll stop here because this is my where I was hoping to stop with this diagram and we'll start from here. So thank you very much. So what that means, have a great weekend. I'll get working on these. I just you know the ones you turned in the other day. If anybody didn't turn them in and needs to, this would be the opportune moment.